You know, we've been going, today is the last day in this series called Consumed. And it's basically been, we've been going through our vision as a church. I don't know if you guys noticed that. We started off the year, and our vision as a church is to be a Holy Spirit-driven church, meaning we recognize that we don't want to be a church that's, you know, operating on our own strength. We want to be a church that's Holy Spirit-centered, driven by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we went through a series in the beginning of the year called Breakthrough, all about the Holy Spirit. And then the next part of our vision is to be growing in a passionate love with Jesus. Because the truth of the matter is, is, you know, when you measure maturity, God doesn't look at, as we want to be mature disciples in Christ, he's not looking about how much Bible knowledge that you have. He's not looking about whether or not you can check off the many religious check boxes. What he's looking at is, are you growing in a love with him? Are you being consumed? Does your life, from, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, is it focused on God? Is it consumed? Are you madly in love with God? That's what God cares about. That's what he wants us to focus on. And so that's the second part of our vision as a church is to be growing, not in Bible knowledge, that will come, not in all the other religiosities, but in love with God. Just growing in love. I mean, do you love God more this year than you did last year? And that's what God wants. He wants us to be growing in that deep, intimate love. And so we've been going through this series called Consumed, about growing in a passionate love with God. But as I was getting ready for this sermon today, throughout this week, I was starting to think, what does that really look like to grow in a passionate love with Jesus? I mean, when you think about growing in a passionate love with God, what is that? What, is that, what kind of mental picture do you come up with? For me, I come up with this mental picture of when Moses was walking up onto the mountain Sinai and God gave him the Ten Commandments. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but in Exodus we read that uh, Moses walked up to the Mount Sinai and he met God literally. And he says when he came down, he had, had this Shekinah glory, which is like this divine glory around him, so much that his face was shining that they had to put a veil over his face so it wouldn't be blinding to the people. That's the kind of intimacy. When I think of just growing in a passionate love, I just want those, oh, you know, those like, those divine moments with God that you're just like, you know, he had most... Everyone, man, Moses, it's not fair. He had all the cool moments with God, didn't he? I mean, he had the burning bush experience. If you're not familiar with this, you know, I mean, it's like Moses was out doing day-to-day work, and, you know, when he saw God in a burning bush that didn't really burn, and God revealed himself to that. I mean, so all these mountaintop experiences with God. And so that's some of the things, when I think about growing and being consumed with God, it's like I want my own mountaintop. I want my own burning bush. Don't you? Don't you want that? Well, life's not that way. I mean, for instance, this past week, I felt so far from God, you guys. Just being honest. I've just been feeling really far from God. I mean, I've been far. I don't doubt my belief in God. It hasn't been one of those weeks where I've doubted God. And I've been reading the word. I've been in prayer, worship. But nonetheless, I've just been feeling really distracted by God. Distracted and not close to God. And I started to think, oh man, how am I growing this passionate love with God? And I want to be consumed, especially as a pastor. You know, I'm supposed to be the spiritual leader, right? And so it's just like this extra pressure. Not that anyone puts this on me, but you kind of put it on yourself. You buy into that old just myth and it is a myth you know but it's like you bind that it's like oh i got to be consumed with god i have to be on this level 10 all the time emotionally excited just you know enthusiastic and and just be on this level 10 but the truth of the matter is i feel like i've been on a level five and if i'm honest there's times i'm at a level two and i just say man am i growing or am i dying i mean what's going on And then God kind of broke through, not with an emotional experience, but with his truth. It's the simple fact is is that there are going to be different times in our lives where we have those burning bush experiences, 
those encounters. And we need those divine encounters with God. Those are called the mountaintops. Mountaintop experiences with God. When you've worked your way up or you've been elevated up to a mountaintop and you can see everything clearly, it's beautiful, it's breathtaking, but you don't live on the mountaintop. Do you? You don't live, no one lives on the mountaintop. You live in the valley or the plains. That's where you live. You don't live up in the mountains. Life is not about being on cloud nine with God. I mean, many of you might be on cloud nine with God today. Praise God, enjoy it. But you're not going to live there. That's not reality. And as much as we want it, I want it. I would love to be consumed with God so much that every day I was like, woohoo, you know, it was like a drug. But that's not reality. And if we want to grow in a passionate love with God, we need to learn to understand how to grow in a love with God in the midst of the day-to-day grind. The day-to-day planes. I mean, because think about it. There's the valleys that you go through, which are the hard times when you need to hold on to the promises of God. Then there's the mountaintops, and then there's just the everyday thing. I mean, this is in all relationships, isn't it? I mean, one of the, I mean, think about, you know, if you have a close friend. If you have a close friend and you're really close, you may think they're super cool and you have like a bromance or a girlmance, you know, uh, with them. You know, you may think they're super cool, but they're not going to be super exciting all the time. If they are, you're not hanging out with them all the time. I mean, look at a marriage. I mean, marriages, everyone wants marriages, whether you're single or not, you dream of this marriage that's going to be bliss. Now, if you're sitting with your spouse, don't look at them and say, yeah, all right. (laughs) But, you know, I mean, let's be honest, okay? The the truth of the matter is it's not all bliss, all right? I mean, yeah, I know you're thinking, oh, honey, he's not talking about us. (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) Yeah, I'm talking about you. Yeah. I, I know that marriage is, and it's not healthy, if it's, that's not reality. Reality is learning to fall in love with the person in the day in and the day out. Reality is when you wake up and you're like, oh, all right, you know, hey, you know, I mean, that's, that's reality. I mean, that's reality when you wake up and you just say, oh, I'm still going to love. This person's not looking as awesome as they were last night. You know, I mean, that's just, hey, that's the day-to-day, is it not? That's the day-to-day, the grind. We all want to live on the mountaintops, but God says life is spent in the plains. Life is spent in the plains, but here's the beautiful thing. It's in the plains that the fruit takes place. Does the farmer grow his fruit on the mountaintop? No. He grows his fruit on the plains. You don't sit there and build that deep, room, that deep intimacy with anyone on the mountaintop experience. It comes from the day in and the day out commitment in love. And that's how we want to learn. If we're going to be consumed with God, growing in that passionate love with God, we need to recognize that this is a journey. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And that's what truth, our walk with God is a lifelong journey. It's a marathon. It's not something you can sit there and say, oh God, pump me up, pastor, so I can go out there and sprint. Sprint, no, you have to learn that it's a marathon and it's going to be a day in and day out. And there's going to be times where you're going to want to give up. And there's going to be times where you're like on cloud nine and you just think this is the best thing. But then there's going to be the times like, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm going to, you know, I, I want to, but I kind of feel far from God. I know he's there. I believe in God, but I don't necessarily feel super close to him. And I just, you know what I mean? It's in those times where God wants us to press through and grow in a passionate love with him. It's in those times, those day-to-day experiences. So if you're in one of those situations right now, if you're in a cloud nine, praise God, enjoy it, it's not going to last. 
It's a great thing. You need to have those encounters. It's important to have cloud nine experiences, just as in any relationship. But they don't last, and they're not meant to. You have to be on the ground. If you're on the ground and you're feeling far from God, or just kind of blasé, relax, you're normal. One sense of the word, you're normal. But it's, that's part of our walk with God. What I want to talk about this morning and explore with you is how Scripture teaches us how to grow in a passionate love with God in the day-to-day journey with God, the marathon race with God, how we can grow and experience God in the marathon journey with God, not the sprint journey, how we can grow intimately with God in the day-in and day-out grind, how you may be facing the time when you're feeling far from God and you're just doing the, the routine and you may feel cold inside and you're like, God, I don't know if my love is growing cold, but how do you foster that love and make that flame burn bright? And to do this, I want to look at a man after God's own heart after a man who followed God in the valleys, the plains, and in the mountaintops, who had God as a poor shepherd to the king of Israel. And many of you know I'm talking about David, King David. The second king of the nation Israel was called a man after God's own heart. It wasn't because David was perfect. As I like to say, David was a sinner, not a mistaker. I mean, he committed some doozies of a mistake. But nonetheless, he had a heart for God. And he learned this to serve and to love God and grow with God in the midst of the day-to-day grind. Because he had mountaintops experiences where he saw God deliver him from his enemies and the victories. And he had God in the midst of the deep valleys when he was being chased. But even in the day-to-day life, David learned to grow in a passionate love with God. And we see in, his, in the scripture how he did this. So turn with me to Psalm 103, one of David's psalms that he's writing to God or to himself as well, praising God. And in Psalm 103, I want to just look at the first two verses that's to start off with. But look at these verses here. David starts off with in Psalm 103, he says, praise the Lord my soul, All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits. All right. So it's important to understand that when David is saying praise the Lord my soul, he's actually commanding himself to praise God. Do you find that interesting? I do. I find that encouraging. Because even like in a day like this past week I've had, there have been times where I just haven't had an interest in praising God. I've just been kind of blasé. But what we read here with David is he's sitting there recognizing, here's King David who had an intimate relationship, who saw David, who defeated Goliath, who became, went from a shepherd boy to king, had all these mountaintop experiences with God. But nonetheless, he finds himself commanding himself to praise God because he realizes sometimes he doesn't want to praise God. Sometimes he's feeling just blasé. And so he says, praise the Lord. And he doesn't just command himself to praise God. He says, my inmost soul, meaning to the depths of my heart, I need to praise God. Now, what does it mean to praise God? What is David talking about? I mean, is it just to sing a song? It's not it at all. And why does God want us to praise him? I mean, that's a huge question. I don't know if you thought about that. If not, let me drop a bomb on you. Doesn't it seem a little egotistical at times? Maybe you haven't thinking. Maybe this is my, my mental craziness. But I've actually wondered at different times, what kind of God needs us to praise him so much? I mean, isn't that a little crazy? I mean, throughout Scripture, praise him, worship me, no other God before me. I mean, are you that egotistical that you need self-validation from us that often? That, you know, I mean, has anyone else thought this or am I just crazy? All right. But I've thought this. And then God was just quickly, you know, he straightened me up pretty quick. And he, you know, 
the point is, it's that we worship God. God commands us to worship him, to praise him, to give him thanks. It's not because he's in desperate need of our adoration. He's God. He needs absolutely nothing. He's completely self-sufficient, completely 100% confident in himself. He's not from us. And this is the really cool thing. When we worship God, when we praise God, what's happening in our own hearts is the benefit of worship. It's not about God receiving the worship. It's about us worshiping God and being blessed by our acts of worship. Because here's the key thing. When we praise God, what we are doing is taking our eyes off of ourself and putting them on God. We are taking our eyes off of our problems and putting them on the problem solver. We're taking our eyes off our circumstances and putting it on the one who controls all things. You see, that's what praise. Praise, essentially, you could be called focus. And David was committed to focusing on God. No matter what he was doing, whether he was a poor shepherd boy, a soldier, a fugitive from Saul, or the king of Israel, he was committed to focusing on God. And he commanded himself, even when I don't feel like focusing, I'm going to command my inmost being to focus on God. Because he knows, even though he may feel far from God, it's important to grow in him to say, this is what matters. It's not about singing. You know what singing is? When we worship God, it's the purpose isn't just to sing, because I can't sing, all right? Many of you know that if you sit behind me. The purpose of the matter is, it's to get our focus off ourselves. We begin with worship, with singing, because it automatically says, no matter what was going on in my life, hey, I got in a fight with my wife on the way to church. It was like a war zone just to get here. But praise God, now I'm going to refocus my life just on what truly matters on God. And so that's what we do. That's why we praise God. And David is saying, you need to do that in the day-to-day grind. You don't just do it on the mountaintops, and you don't just do it when you're in desperate needs. It's a daily thing. And what that does is it helps you continually stay focused on him in all circumstances. It helps you remember that no matter what you're going through, that God is the one in control. It helps you remember that no matter where you're at, God is right there with you. It's steeping you focused on the true things that matter. This is why we read in Hebrews chapter 13. Listen to this powerful thing. It says, for here we do not have an enduring city. What he's talking about, the author of Hebrews, is saying here on earth we don't have an enduring city. But we are looking for a city that is to come. What? Your focus. And then he goes on and says, therefore, through Jesus... Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. What do you see what he's saying there? This is matching up exactly what David's command and commitment to worship God is. He's saying, because we don't live and we don't hear this earth is not our home, we're aliens and strangers here, we stay focused on the true kingdom, the true call in our lives. Through the day-to-day grind, through the highs and the lows and everything in between where most of life happens, we stay focused on God and praise him because when we praise him, we stay focused on what truly matters. And we grow. We grow. Just as when you are in your relationships with your loved ones, if you have kids and you want to strangle your kids at different times, You stay focused on what really matters. And your spouse, when you want to strangle your spouse, you stay focused on what really matters. Jail time if you strangle them. No. You should stay focused on what really matters. It's the same thing. So what does that look like when David says, offer up praises, praise my inmost soul? How do you translate that into your everyday life when you feel far from God? Well, even when you feel far from God, you wake up and you're praising God that you woke up. Every day is a gift from God. Tomorrow and today isn't even guaranteed. 
But you're not just praising God to go to work. You're praising God that he's given you a work to go to. And that true job isn't no matter what. It's not about being a teacher. It's not about being, you know, wherever your job may be. It's about serving God and knowing that you're called to be a light and salt here on earth. You see, it's that focus. You're recognizing, oh my gosh, sometimes I can just get focused on the wrong things. And when I praise God, it gets me focused on the right things. And so practically speaking, when we're praising God, it's not about singing songs. It's about focusing on the fact, even when we sang those songs, it's about focusing on the fact that God is our redeemer. God is our protector. He is the one that's going to be in our situation. No matter what you're going through, he is the one there. So I'm going to praise God and focus on him. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to praise God for my family because he's going to give them. When I get home, I'm going to praise God for the opportunity to relax. All things that I do, even in the humdrum day in, day out things, my focus is going to be committed on praising God. And that's how David kept his fire burning bright. And if you look at David's son Solomon and all the other kings that were after David, their focus drifted. Day in and day out, Solomon started out, if you're aware of this or not, Solomon, David's son, became the third king, the wealthiest king, the wisest king, but a king who eventually, and you read in the book of Ecclesiastes, eventually kind of got off focused and got off track in his walk with God. David, a man after God's own heart, not perfect, but were committed to being focused. And not just that, look what he says at the end of verse two. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits. That's kind of an odd thing for King David to say. I mean, this is the man who defeated Goliath who God endured, yet he's telling himself to not forget all of God's benefits. Do you forget the benefits of following God sometimes? I do. I mean, there's been times just recently, um, I was having dinner at a family member's house and another friend came up to me and started telling me about this great opportunity to make a ton of money. It was kind of like this get rich quick scheme, but not really a scheme. It was honest and stuff, but it was still get rich quick. And I just started thinking, oh, wow, how cool would it be if I had more money? How cool would it be if I could just, you know, all the things I could do? And I started thinking, oh, yeah, if I could do this and spend a few hours this day and, and I could get this. And yeah, that would be awesome. You know, I could do so much. And then God just kind of went, what are you talking about? Do you not have enough right now? You, what is more money going to bring you? It's not that more money is bad, but what is it that you're lacking right now? Are you lacking? You think more money is going to bring you that which you're lacking? And you see, was this this distraction? And I was forgetting the true benefits of following God because I started to sit there and say, oh, man, did I choose the wrong career? You know, I mean, it's like, man, all these money. And he was talking about all these things he was buying and stuff and all his money. I'm like, oh, man, I'm never going to make that. You know, and I just said, oh, darn it, man. I just got the wrong master's degree. And, just, and I was just thinking about this. And then God just saying, what are you talking about? You serve the king. You serve the mighty king. There's no greater job. There's no greater position. You are serving the eternal purpose, storing up yourselves for treasures for eternity. And I was just starting to forget this. And, and life happens that way. You see, we're being constantly bombarded, aren't we? With messages from the world. Rather, we're being bombarded from promises from the world that are false and hollow. And the world is constantly telling you, if you gain this possession, if you make this amount, if you achieve this status, then you will be that much better off. And we buy into this. I'll sit down and relax and watch some TV, and then I'll just sit there and say, oh, yeah, I need that. 
Oh, look how happy they are with that. And I get these messages that tell me, you, if you only had this, if you shaved with this, you would look this way. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to start shaving then. You know, I mean, it's just, it, you know, I mean, it's just these messages that we're continually bombarded with. And I just started thinking, wow, you know, I'm forgetting the benefits of God. And we do that as we walk on the day-to-day grind because we're constantly surrounded in a world that is not our home. This is not our home. And so David says, forget not his benefits. And look what he says in verse three. He who forgives all your sin and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. And I love this one. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. And God gives us every good and perfect gift. See, what David is doing is not giving us an exhaustive list of God's benefits. What is he doing? He's just giving a glimpse of the promises of God. And one of the things that David learned in order to grow in the day in and day out grind of life was to be committed to worshiping or focused on God and faithful or committed to holding on to God's promises. And he just listed a few. You guys need to hold on to God's promises. See, some of you need to hold on to the fact that God promises to answer you when you cry out to him. Some of you need to hold on to the promise that God has a plans and hope for your future, as it says in Jeremiah 29, 11. Some of you need to promise, hold on to the promise that God has promised to give you life and life abundantly, John 10, 10. Some of you need to hold on to the promise that Christ is the only way, John 14, 6. Some of you need to hold on to the promise that God wants to give you eternal fruit and have a successful life, John 15, 5. Some of you need to hold on to the promise that when you're going through hard times, God promises to work out everything for his good and perfect will according to those who love him, Romans 8, 28. Some of you need to hold on to the promise that even though you're having through hard times in this life, God is greater than he who's in this world and he's be- beaten Satan himself, John 16, 33. Some of you need to hold on to the promise that no matter where you're at, God is good and he's perfect and he's never changing. He promises to never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. You see, these are just a few of the many promises of God that we need to hold on to. Those are what's going to help you not just get through the grind of life, but help you grow in the grind of life. Those are going to be the things that sit there and say, oh, yeah, I'm not going to forget the benefits of God. Because my natural tendency is to take things for granted. I mean, let's be honest. We take everyone for granted, including God. And you tend to, and spouses and family members will know this, we tend to take for granted those we love the most. It's true. Parents, kids take you for granted. They love you the most, but they take you for granted the most. Spouses, you guys take each other for granted. Why? Because, oh, you'll always be there for me. And so you forget the benefits of that spouse. You see, we tend to take each other for granted, and we forget that most important relationship, just as we tend to take God for granted. And so he's saying, look it, in your day-to-day grind, do not forget to praise God. Be committed to staying focused on God. But you know what? Also, be committed to remember God's benefits. Hold on to his promises. Ask yourself, what promise do you need to hold on to today? Maybe it's God's promise that you're go- he's holding you in the midst of that dark valley, that he will be your shepherd That even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you shall not fear evil because God is with you. Maybe that's the promise you're holding on to. Maybe it's just the promise that God is going to work out all things according to his good and perfect will. See, these are promises of God. What promise do you need to help you go through the day to day? This is a marathon, remember? Not a sprint. You see, I, I so often, I think so often that For those who live in countries that are facing more physical persecution, we often don't we sit there and say it's harder for them to be Christians because they have to give up their life and all their possessions? I would agree to one degree. Follow me. 
If you were to say, give up your life or deny Christ, or deny Christ and give up your life, one of the two there, you know what I mean. Uh, if you were to say that, it would be a hard decision for you to make. But it's a one-time decision in that case. You see, a lot of times when you live that, once you make that choice, you've made that choice. The problem is, it's not those one-time mountaintop experiences. It's taking up your cross daily and following Jesus. You see, in America here, we don't suffer that same crucial point of decision. But what we do is we have this constant flood of blase, this constant flood of take it easy, relax. You can have Jesus and the world, the American dream too. It's this constant flood of it's okay, but just don't take it too seriously. You guys understand what I'm saying? It's so much more challenging in one way. It's if I said to you, look it, either believe in Jesus or don't believe in Jesus and live, believe in Jesus and die, it would be a much more crucial moment. It would be easier for us to say, oh my gosh, this is real. I have to really put my money where my mouth is. But it's when you daily have to do it. It's when you daily have to pick up your cross that it begins, the world's message begins to wear us down. We begin to sit there and say, oh yeah, you know, it doesn't really matter if I do that. It doesn't really matter if I do this. And God's saying, no, hold on to my promises. And this leads me to the very last thing I want to share with you. David was not only committed to holding on to his promises, but because he recognized it was a journey, a marathon relationship with God, he learned to be faithful in the little things. Faithful in the little things. I love what Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Let me read this to you. It says, he who is faithful or trustworthy, depending on your version, and the very little things is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous and very little things is unrighteous also in much. And then Jesus goes later on in Matthew 25, he says, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. What Jesus is teaching us here, what scripture tells us here, is that in the day-to-day -day walk with him, faithfulness is essential in the little things just as much in the big things. Because if you're to learn to live in the marathon journey with God, we need to learn to be faithful in the everyday steps with God. I mean, some of you might sit there and say, oh, well, I haven't denied Christ, but I lie on my taxes. That's not denying Christ. Oh, I haven't, you know, cheated on my wife. Oh, but I watch porn. That's not cheating on your wife. Oh, I haven't done this, but I've done this. You see, it's the little things that God also, that gets us through the days. And when it's the little things that we're unfaithful with the little things that create us having the unfaithfulness in the big things. You see, you don't start off denying Christ. It's that little progression of faithfulness. And this is what happened to King Solomon. This is what happened to all the other kings. He began to be a little bit faithless in the little things. And he fell on the big things. What David, even though he struggled and he had some big doozies, did he not? If you didn't know, David was an adulterer. David was a murderer. Those are pretty big doozies. Let's be honest. But when confronted with his sin, he immediately repented to God. He immediately came back to God. It's not about being perfect on our journey with God. It's about being consistent on our journey with God. Consistently seeking God. Being committed to worship him. Being committed to hold on to his promises. And being committed to being faithful and obedient in all things, even the little things. Think about the little things in your life right now. What areas are you making compromises in your life right now that God is simply saying, oh, that matters. Oh, no, that doesn't matter. No, it does matter. Be faithful in the little things, and that'll help you in your journey, staying growing in passionate love with God. It's those little things in our relationships with each other that make all the difference, right? It's not enough to simply have the mountaintops experiences. 
I think about how I would want to be a hero to my daughter, and I really do. My wife, too, but especially my little girl, okay? <laughs> you know, I just, I want to be a hero to her. But you think it's going to be when I come and save her from the fire or those big metaphorical fires? No. It's not when I show up to her, her one championship game. It's when I'm in her life in the day-to-day -day life. It's when I'm there for her every day. It's the journey of my love for her. And the same with my wife. It's not if I bring her Valentine's flowers. I, I, I just be honest, ladies, I hate Valentine's. Because I hate to be told when I have to give my wife flowers. I'm rebellious. I have that rebellious streak in me, you know. But I love to bring my wife flowers. I just don't want to be told and then pay triple the amount. I want, to be, I want to do it because I'm loved to do it, not because, come on, guys, right? I mean, that's just like, you know, I mean, that's just the simple truth. I want to do it out of an act of love, not an act of obligation. But those acts of love aren't going to come to her. She's not going to receive that love when I'm simply told to do it one time. It's going to be that day in, day out faithfulness to her that's going to, that it's going to reveal my love to her. And it's going to grow that passionate love. Does that make sense? It's the same way with our journey with God. You guys, I want us as a church to grow in a passionate love with God. Well, we're consumed with passion with love God. I want those mountaintop experiences, but the reality is, is we don't live on the mountaintops, we live in the plains. We live in the day-to-day -day grind of life. If we're to grow in a passionate love with God, we need to learn to be committed, to be focused on God. And day to day on that journey, that journey with passion with God. We need to learn to be faithful and hold on to his promises on that day to day. And we need to learn to be faithful in the little things. Just as David would. He was faithful as a shepherd boy. He was faithful as a soldier. Even as a fugitive, he was faithful to God. And he was faithful as a king. And so God said, you are a man after my own heart. He was consumed with love for God. And it did not happen overnight. It happened in the marathon journey of his life. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come on out in the venue and the worship team and Pastor Spencer to come on out here in the sanctuary. And this next time is such a powerful response for us because this is not the time to simply check out, but it's a time to say, what has the Holy Spirit been saying to me? My prayer as we started off is that you would have a breakthrough experience with the Holy Spirit. But part of that breakthrough experience with the Holy Spirit is how are you gonna to choose to respond to him right now? How are you going to choose to respond to what he's been speaking to you about this morning? You see, maybe you're on cloud nine, praise God, learn, to run the marathon. Maybe you are running the marathon right now and you're exhausted and you wanna give up. Stay focused. Be committed to praising God. Bless the Lord with all your soul. Why? Because when you bless him, you're the one who's being blessed. When you bless him, when you praise him, when you worship him, your focus is off yourself and on to him and who he's made you to be. Some of you need to hold on to the promises of God because you're tired and you need to remember the finish line is worth it. The benefits of God are worth it for he redeems your soul. He forgives your sin. He renews your strength. He restores your joy. He promises to be faithful in your life. He is the truth, the way, and the life. He is an abundant life in him. He is the joy that surpasses all understanding. He is the one that is faithful in all circumstances. He is the one that never changes, does not lie. He is the one that promises to be with us, never forsake us. This is the God that we serve. This is our Lord, amen? This is the God that we have. Let's pray.